we are talking about the last dance. So, let's dance. Oh my. Oh my god, this is ridiculous. A Kobe Bryant patch autograph Woo! number four of ten. How is it going everybody? And welcome back to my channel, Kobe Cards. With all of the buzz around The Last Dance right now, I thought it was only fitting to create a new series on my channel, which is going to be talking about The Last Dance, but from the perspective of a basketball fan, a Lakers fan, and a Kobe fan. So we're not likely going to be diving into the Kobe capsule during this series, but the content should still somewhat cater to the Kobe fans out there, as I'm looking to do this from the standpoint of a Kobe fan watching the documentary. As I'm sure most of you are aware, The Last Dance is a 10-part series where there are two episodes every Sunday for five weeks, and this started on April 19th, which was this past weekend. So let's get into the first video. We'll see how much I'm able to cover in today's video um, without it being excessively long, but the topics that I want to cover are one, the timing of the documentary, Two, the unprecedented access that was given to get this footage. Three, the treatment of Phil Jackson. Four, young MJ versus young Kobe. Five, the decision to go pro. Six, the NBA draft and how it played out. Seven, the state of the Bulls franchise. Eight, the circus. Nine, the impact of family. Ten, Pippen demanding a trade and 11 Jordan's foot injury. So the first thing that I want to touch on is the timing of the release of this documentary. Needless to say, the timing was very interesting. From the standpoint that it's likely that people will be staying home for the next five weeks, it makes for great content and even better ratings. Because literally every single person is watching this and is glued to their TVs. The fact that I'm making this video is almost too cliche because all I see on any news feed on any form of social media is Michael Jordan. The second perspective, and the more interesting one, is that Jordan was somewhat convinced that this timing made sense, and one of the reasons that they gave, publicly at least, is that they wanted to shift some of the attention off of the debates people are having with LeBron versus MJ. What they aren't telling you, though, is that Kobe has to be a reason, too. We're literally three months out from Kobe's passing, and suddenly people who are saying that Kobe wasn't even in their top 25 all time are admitting he's top 10, and people who had him in their top 10 are admitting he's actually top 5, and so on and so forth. And with Kobe being such a hot topic, it's only natural to compare him to Jordan because the two of them had the most similar style of play of almost any two players that you could compare ever. Before you start saying, no, this has nothing to do with Kobe, and Jordan and all the producers will tell you that this isn't about Kobe, well, duh, they're going to say that. Who in their right mind would be like, yeah, let's tell people that we're releasing this because we want to try to one-up a dead, cherished legend. That would absolutely tarnish Jordan's reputation if he even tried to acknowledge any type of disrespect against Kobe. We all know Jordan had a ton of respect for Kobe, and it just wouldn't fly for Kobe to be in the conversation, at least from a public perspective, for the sake of Jordan's image. Thus, while we can acknowledge that it made sense from a business perspective to release this, and with the viewership likely through the roof with everyone at home, it all makes sense. But let's not be foolish enough to ignore that it's horrible timing as well, essentially coinciding with the mourning that people are still doing for Kobe. The second thing that we are going to talk about is the unprecedented access that was granted for this documentary. As they mentioned literally at the beginning of the film, a film crew was given what they said was unprecedented access behind the scenes and inside the Bulls locker room for a year. And this was beginning with the season preparations that were going into the 1997-98 season. As a Kobe fan, the first thing that came to my mind was, is there anything like this that was granted for Kobe's 20th and final season as a Laker? 
maybe it was unprecedented in 1997 to have film crews around, but now that there was a precedent, literally all I can think about is, I wonder if they did this for Kobe. Is there secretly a collection of footage from Kobe's farewell tour that was gathered with the hopes of one day turning that into a documentary? Something that, you know, caught all of the tributes that each team shared to honor Kobe in the last games that Kobe would play against those teams. And something that showed all the jersey swapping and all of the star players around the league and even the not star players around the league talking about what Kobe meant to them and growing up watching Kobe play and how he inspired them. You'd think that that would absolutely have to be out there somewhere with footage. And that makes me really unsettled because now that's really what I want to see. And I know that there are tons of other people who would want to see that. Hopefully a few years from now, if everyone ends up signing off on it legally, we may have the chance to get even closer to Kobe and follow him around what maybe for him could have been the last slither. The third thing on the list that I want to talk about is Phil Jackson. First off, no matter who you are, whether you're a Lakers fan, a Bulls fan, a Ceiling fan, I don't care what you're a fan of. Everybody knows that Phil Jackson is one of, if not the best NBA coach in the history of basketball. He has 11 championships as a head coach, which is the most of any coach in history, and is the only head coach to have multiple championships with different franchises. It was honestly horrifying for me to watch Phil reenact Jerry Krause, telling him that even if he went 82-0 and brought another championship, that there was no way that he was coming back and that he was 100% in his final year coaching. The amount of disrespect right there was through the roof. I mean, who does that? Who tells someone to go and do their job for a year, but by the way, there is no way in the world that you'll have your job next year. And to do that to a coach who had already at the time brought the organization from nothing into a perennial contender and brought them their first five and only championships? There is no one who is made to look worse in this entire documentary than Jerry Krause. I'm, well, let's be honest, he definitely got the short end of the stick during filming. It's like, okay, we need a villain here. Who's it going to be? Jerry, Jerry, Jerry. The irony of all of this is that Phil Jackson was the one who came up with the name The Last Dance. It was what he referred to as his own final season, and that's how the documentary got its name. With how Jerry treated people, though, and Phil Jackson being one of the most disrespected by Krause, I do understand why Jordan came out publicly and said he's not going to play for any other coach other than Phil Jackson. And that ended up being true in terms of his Chicago days, even though he technically played for the Washington Wizards later when he came back to basketball under Doug Collins, but that's totally different circumstances. Actually, could you imagine if he did come back in 2001 and was like, I still demand to play for Phil Jackson and no one else? Then technically he would have been refusing to play for any other team than the Lakers. And in 2001, that would have meant that Jordan was demanding to play with Kobe and Shaq and that Kobe and MJ would have been teammates. Okay, okay, okay. That's it for my Phil Jackson digression. Let's not uh, talk too much about those what ifs. The fourth thing on my list to cover is MJ versus Kobe in high school. This to me was super fascinating and even funny at times. One thing that I learned is that Jordan didn't even make the varsity basketball team in high school until his junior year because his coaches said he was, and I quote, nothing special. Literally nothing about this documentary was funny in either of the first two episodes other than those few lines, which gave me a pretty good chuckle. Obviously, no one was expecting this to be a comedy, so I wasn't expecting to laugh much, but I couldn't help myself during that part. Between his sophomore and junior years in high school, they said that Jordan grew from 5'10 to 6'3, and according to the coaches, that made him, and I quote again, into a better player. Well, duh! Take any person and add five inches, and of course they're going to be taken just a little bit more seriously in high school sports. I'm sure if he was seven foot three, the coaches would have paid even more attention to him as well. 
All of this is drastically different than Kobe's high school experience at Lower Marion, though. Kobe became one of the first ever freshmen to make varsity right out of the gate at Lower Marion. And he was a special talent for all four years. He was winning dunk contests at the age of 15. And whereas Michael struggled a little bit with his identity issues, Kobe in high school had more so of a swagger to him. So even though it's just high school days and not really that earth shattering in the grand scheme of things, if Kobe were going up against Jordan, both of them in high school, based on what I was seeing, it's pretty obvious that Kobe would have probably whooped Jordan. Again, irrelevant in the grand scheme of things to talk about how one person would have done against another person from the age of, you know, 15, 16, 17, 18, but interesting nonetheless. I did also make a video as well detailing how Kobe Bryant was the youngest starter in NBA All-Star Game history, and that was during the first ever All-Star Game matchup that Kobe played against Jordan, and in that video, one of the things that I said was that Kobe was just better than most players, faster than most players, and from a younger age. And that seems to hold even when bringing Jordan into the equation. Kobe was doing things at 15 years old that Jordan wasn't doing at 15. And same for both, you know, 16, 17, 18. Obviously, Michael makes up more than enough ground to make everybody happy later in life. But I do think that comparing the younger versions of them is pretty interesting. All right, so taking a look at the time, I think we're going to stop there. We do have a lot more to cover in our next video. Uh, the decisions to go pro, the NBA draft, State of the Bulls franchise, the circus, family, Pippen demanding a trade, the foot injury, and the minutes restrictions. And I look forward to covering all of that next time. If you enjoyed this video and want to support my ongoing tribute to Kobe, I hope you consider subscribing so you can follow along as we continue our journey to remember and celebrate the life and career of Kobe Bryant. Thank you for watching, and I will see you next time.